awesome. We got quite the full house here. This is totally what we expected. As you all know, the whole purpose of today is to touch on AI in CI. And what's we're going to be discussing what's been happening today, what's happening in the future. And you know, I think there's enough people in here to lay out the surprise. We received over 60 questions from the community. So there's a ton of great stuff. Uh, we were just chatting amongst the team here that we'll probably do follow-ups to this so we can get through all of those questions. Um, but hope everyone uh, is ready for a jam-packed session. And of course, I am not doing this solo. I'm joined by, and oh, oh, maybe I'll quickly introduce myself if people don't know me. I'm the Competitive Enablement Manager here at Clue. We're a Competitive Enablement Platform. But I'm also joined by the wonderful James Raffield, who is a great director of competitive intelligence in his own right. So I'll pass it over to James to say a few words and uh, and say hello. How are you doing, James? I'm doing well, Brandon. Thanks. Uh, always great to be here with you and the Clue team and the community with so many questions. I think uh, in talking to Adam and Laura earlier, one of the things that in every conversation we get in and how we use AI and CI, we very quickly find out, as Adam said, that it's... Uh, the, the wild blue yonder out there in front of us now. So we're all trying to figure out um, not only what to do and how to do it, but what are the best tools that we can use? What are some best practices? You know, what do we need to be concerned out with uh, concerned about with security and privacy? And because AI is still so new um, with training and development, even, you know, the marketing around AI and how it can be used is still brand new. I don't think uh, anybody in the world is sick of thinking about all of the cool things that AI can do for us. And, I'm happy to be involved with the community. And, you know, this is very much about um, us sharing some of the experiences early on and what we've done in CI, but also an opportunity to spend time with the community here and understand what are your concerns, questions that you have, where do you see this going as well? Um, I mean, we can give you a little bit of insight in what we're using, but from the community, definitely be pouring in here, you know, what you're thinking about, where you see the direction of AI going, where you feel like it would be most useful in your um, current CI or enablement strategies. So really happy to be spending time with the community in this today. You know, James, I'm curious to hear, what was the first way that you worked with AI that really kind of opened your eyes to what was possible? Do you remember that first interaction you had and some of the jobs to be done that you were you were trying to accomplish using AI? Yeah, so um, in the early days, I was using it really to be more creative, to help me be more creative. Um, and I started thinking about CI and the I could create a single asset um, for competitive intelligence, but I need to communicate it um, across five different personas. So there might be pieces of that intelligence that I've collected that I want to communicate differently to my C-level executives um, than I communicated to my AEs and my SEs. So I really started using um, ChatGPT um, to help me be, be more creative in the way that I approached communicating with those different groups. Now, that's not distribution, but... Um, um, in the early stages, what I would do is say, this is a this is a really good piece of collateral. This is a really good competitive intelligence asset that I've created. It's been out in the field. I got great re reception. Um, I can see that this material was being consumed, got positive reviews, and I can see that it had an impact on revenue. So when I started training my GPTs, I would say, this is my best material. This is what I've got the most um, traction on. This is what's been picked up by the team, most, most made the most impact for revenue. Um, so I started with saying, this is my best stuff, um, and please keep me to this standard. So every time that I would log into ChatGPT, I would feed it my best stuff and say, this is my best stuff for today. This is the list of materials that I need to create. This is an, the intelligence that I have. Um, and I would use it to help me do things like creative outlining and layouts for how I was going to use that asset to communicate across different teams. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And that actually touches on another question we received from the community, which was around balancing inputs to get the right output. Uh, in other words, how much information should you feed to an AI tool in order to get some of those responses? And we will, of course, touch on the security and trust concerns. But before we get into that, it sounds like, James, you were really using uh, AI tools and providing content that you had, and that was helping build that profile of, hey, here's here's some good here's what good content looks like to us help me create this other content. And while you did say that you maybe didn't consider that distributing Intel, I feel like that's pretty darn close. I mean, if you are using it to almost translate the Intel to be more effective in order to be distributed to say sales engineers, I think that's a, a great use case of AI uh, yeah. to take content and, and tweak it. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say that's kind of the perfect modeling. That's where we wanna be today, right? Is the way we started in those early days, which was, 
um, you ask chat GPT or you ask AI to produce something for you, and then you have to give context and relevancy to that data that's now been provided. Um, this is one of the ways that we continue this process of um, enabling accuracy inside AI and this data that we're going to use. But let me reel back real quick. I didn't tell you where I, where I started, actually. That was uh, <laughs> misleading when I did this. So when I first um, saw ChatGPT3, I was like, holy cow, man, this thing can go out and do these scrapes and it's got all this info. I quickly realized that it couldn't go out and do anything, right? It had a set of data up to a particular point in time in October, right. 2022, right? So it had, a, it had data up to a certain point in time. But what that really did was it, this light bulb went off to me. Um, AI is good for what it knows, right? So it's not actually artificial intelligence in that sense. It's uh, this vast, uh, quick access to this vast repository of data. It's kind of the next evolution of what we were doing when we do Google searches and those kinds of things. Go find this for me, but the added step of not only go find this from a functional sense, but now help me perform some analysis or some function against this, against this data or this information that I've collected. So when I first saw ChatGPT3, it's like, man, I could use this to go do these scrapes. I can do, do these crawls. Like this is going to be so much faster for me. So um, I, I've i operated inside the data protection and data management um, community for the last 30 years. So I was doing competitive intelligence across um, these vendors and backup. Some of them had been there for 30, 40, or 50 years, um, as well as some of the new vendors in SaaS that may have only been there a couple of quarters, right? So I need to look across data across a large section um, of the, the market itself. So I would say things like, please go do a, a, a comprehensive <laughs> product analysis for me on, on my company versus these other, my, my top three competitors. And um, it would, AI would come back, you know, I'd say, go build a table for this because I build tables and matrices for everything. So it would come back with a beautiful table, but not a lot of the data other than maybe product headings and those kind of things inside that table would actually be relevant and usable. Um, it, most of the data would be very generic. Um, an awful lot of it would be completely inaccurate and had nothing to do with the question that I was asking or what I was looking to accomplish. So at that point, I had to make a decision. Do I want to continue to develop this thing that I can see the power of? Or do I need to go away from this and stop wasting time and go back to the way that I used to do this? So um, I met some other people in the AI community and they started teaching me about things like, you know, AI is only going to give you what you ask it for. All right. So as relevant as your question is, and the more um, detail that you can give around what the end game is for you, what do you want to see? What do you need the outcome to be? Um, that's how you get um, to be more accurate and more relevant in the data that it's providing back to you. So I couldn't say, go go create this competitive matrix for me on, on uh, these products inside um, protecting SQL data. You know, that's far too generic. I had to be, um, as I evolved that, I had to be much more precise about saying, create a table for me in this format, include these features for comparison, um, use only facts and details, leave no placeholders and include all of your sources. Now, one of the things that made it more accurate very quickly was that include all of your sources. Because when you say include mm -hmm. all of your sources, it is going to go to very specific places and reference those in the material that's been provided. Um, and it keeps us inside that safe trust space with our end users. It may not be the the absolute detail that we wanted, but what it's helping me do is be more creative in the way that I look at these things. It's helping me be faster in how I create these competitive matrix or matrices, these competitive comparison tables. Um, and once I have that first table in place and I'm comparing features, um, now I can do something similar to the way that I did with my, the content that I mentioned prior, where I create one document and I need to communicate it to five different personas, so five different ways. Um, now that I had this data, data collected into these competitive matrices, I could do something very similar. I could I start to look at that data in very different ways. And rather than being entirely um, quantitative, I could begin to say, now look at this data and tell it what kind of analysis that I wanted to do. Look at the data for these insights. Look at the data for that insight. Compare this insight to the other. Um, so in the early days, what I found out was Asking a simple question oftentimes did not give me um, the answer that I was looking for because we, we are data driven. It has to be quantitative and we have to be able to list our sources. 
So what I learned very quickly was it's only going to give me what I ask for. So the more precise I am and what I ask for and what I want the outcome to be, the better outcome, more accurate, um, safer, and can be validated with uh, with my community and keeps me, keeps me in the trust relationship with uh, the folks inside the organization that I'm giving this data to now or giving these insights to. So right. um, it's questions started out very simple, but they um, as you look through it and you, you'll do this when you start playing with chat GPT, if you haven't already, you'll ask a very simple question, look at your answer. And then from that, you'll see how you need to shape um, how you re-ask that question. So there are instances where I may have, may have started with a simple question, 50 iterations le- later, that simple question is now two paragraphs, um, but my output is, is spot on. Totally. And you're, you're hitting on so many important topics here. I'm like, I'm debating in my mind where we should take this because you're, you've hit on a couple of things. I mean, we saw a lot of questions around just the fundamental kind of prompting skills that one needs to get a good answer out of AI. And I think one, one takeaway I had just out of your story there, James, is, you know, first you just got to experiment. You got to start using these tools, but very quickly you'll start to learn that there's kind of an art and science to how you prompt these tools. Right. And you'll even notice in the the prompts uh, template that we provide, uh, we actually give the AI a role to play and say, hey, imagine you are a VP of product marketing or a competitive intelligence expert, and that helps guide the prompt, uh, or rather guide the AI in terms of how you want to receive that information. And then you touched on another piece there, which goes back to that distribution uh, job that you were that you were accomplishing. Uh, just to drill in there for anyone that's wondering, I think that's a really powerful use case of AI. Not only is it good at generating summaries and an analyzing content, but it can take that content and put it into other formats, into a format that might speak more so to a sales rep, a sales rep in enterprise, a sales rep in enterprise that's selling in EMEA and, and consider different segments, different personas. Um, and just to share, just to, as different a kind of cultures. funny clip, right. different cultures, totally. I'll just share a funny quip. My first interaction with AI uh, that wasn't compete related was was probably just like realizing how wild this is. I started asking questions about um, I think it was about a town like where uh, one of my relatives grew up. And then I asked it, you know, tell me about this town, but give it to me in a limerick, give it to me in a rhyme. And it would start just providing the same info, but in different formats. And I, I share that as kind of a funny story, but I think that's very applicable to this distribution challenge, which it sounds like not as many compete teams are leveraging just yet. Um, and so I think that's one of the next unlocks that we'll start to see is taking content, analyzing and summarizing it, but then packaging it up for different audiences is going to be really powerful. Yeah. So for, for product marketers, you know, this is kind of touching the boundaries where I felt like I don't know, I don't know enough about the law of what I'm doing here. So I need to stop. But internally, this is really, this is really cool and a lot of fun. So I look at ways to, um, I want to increase uh, the uptake of material that I've I uh, create around um, competing product announcements or maybe our own product announcement as a product marketer. So I would go write what I felt like were my very dry um, product announcements um, with my competitive take on where this fits us in market. You know, there's what impact will this will have in our competitive landscape. And I would read those and, and be like, man, this is, this is really dry. Realizing that I'm not terribly creative um, in that respect. Right. So one of the things that I started doing early on is I would write those very dry things and I would say, and then I would list out all of my key stakeholders and I'd go back to my chat GPT and say, this is a document that I've created. This has gotten tremendous uptake. You know, I've, I've got a lot of consumption on, on this piece, but I'd, I'd like to make this announcement with the flair of Star Wars, make my CEO <laughs> this character. And then it would, you know, kind of tear the rest of the characters in with that. And I could rewrite this document for an announcement with a Star Wars flair, you know, pick your ver- pick, pick your, your version wherever you want to be, or I'd say do it like Pirates of the Caribbean or whatever it might be. Do it like Cars. So I used it b- to be more creative. And I did this when I was running a campaign internally that what we communicate, our three-year-old should be able to tell their teacher when they're at, um, you know, when they're at primary school or at nursery school. If they ask what daddy does, I want, I want my three-year-old to be able to say, this is what daddy does for work. Right. Yeah. So yeah. we started experimenting with what are different ways that you can approach just the way you look at this and realizing that, um, Brandon, I bet I could, I, I bet I could name 20 TV shows that you've never seen in your life. I'm that much older than you. I know that for sure. Right. So we have to take, these, we have to take this in account. Um, when we're thinking about how we communicate today, because, um, 
um, I still need to be able to communicate the same message to you, Brandon, in a way that not only that you can understand, but that gets you excited about what's happening, this content that's being delivered, right? So I started using it for ways to look at two key things when I'm communicate, communicate, uh, communicating a message internally. Beyond structure and balance and outline, there are always two things that I want to do with every message that I put out. First is I want to, it, this is a very technical product um, industry that I'm in. So mm -hmm. I always want to make um, at the bottom with those key influencers for me, the ones that will say yes about these tool sets that I'm selling, I want to make first a technical connection with that audience. And then after I make that technical co connection, there's a reason for you to pay attention to me. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to transition that technical um, connection into an emotional connection, right? So I was experimenting with AI in ways that, how are ways that I can make both a technical and emotional connection, like take this piece of content and help me relay this message in a way, um, what I'm really doing is trying to create hooks into those personas, oh. right? So um, because I'm not terribly creative and I realize that's a, a limitation of mine, AI has helped me really um, be more creative and have a different perspective on how I look at how I'm creating content that's gonna be you know, either internal to my field to make an impact on our revenue or external to, uh, to the buyer community on what our competitive differentiators are. Maybe it's not enough today to just give a black and white statement. Maybe we need to be more creative on how we paint these things to make a faster connection um, to our buyers as well. And that's our job as a PMM as well. I, I love that. That's such a great point that like positioning, messaging, connecting with our buyers is ultimately what a lot of us are doing, whether we sit directly on the product marketing team, even if you are in another department, you surely work very closely with product marketing and differentiation is really at its core. Um, I, I want to kind of shift gears here, but because you're, you're, you're sparking another thought in my head, which is related to a huge set of questions we got uh, from the community, which is around these ideas of trust, safety, security, accuracy of answers. And you even shared in your story there, James, that, you know, you, you asked for competitive feature comparison or, or, or rather feature table. And the first attempt wasn't very usable. There were some placeholders in there. It sounded like sourcing was a, was a great uh, kind of takeaway for you. And, and so hopefully people are, are hearing that, that, that providing accurate sources, um, you know, or prompting the tool to provide sources is a great way to increase verifiability. But there still is, are some gaps there. And so maybe I'll, I want to touch on that a little bit. It's also related to a lot of questions we got around just what are the best AI tools available for CI? And so, I mean, one, I'll just share out, of course, we're biased here at Clue, but Clue is an AI tool built for competitive enablement and competitive intelligence professionals. But I think a lot of the stories you're sharing, James, correct me if I'm wrong, was, was largely through ChatGPT. There's a lot of these kind of no cost or low cost AI tools that are great for getting started. And so I think, you know, they're, there are many tools out there. There were some questions like, which is the best for this use case? And I just want to kind of plead the fifth there that say, I mean, firstly, these tools are evolving so fast. And secondly, that it's very hard to really compare, you know, ChatGPT with Perplexity and Clode and all these different tools and Bard um, with specific use cases. What I would recommend is, is try them. A lot of them have a free version or have a low cost version that you can likely expense. Uh, so anyways, I don't want, I want to touch on that, but I also want to dovetail into trust security and accuracy. Cause I think there are a lot of questions from the community, such as, you know, how, you know, do you feel comfortable putting, uh, you know, submitting Intel into these, um, into these models? You know, for, for instance, at Clue, we never share any customer data into any public LLMs. And obviously our customers take uh, data and security extremely seriously because these are their competitive differentiators. This is their secret sauce. They don't want that put into an LLM that could then, you know, inform an answer from a prompt from one of their competitors in the future. And so we keep things very, very separated at Clue for each of our clients. Um, but I'm curious how you thought through that. What was your kind of journey from maybe using some of these open tools um, you know, how did you kind of think through that secure, maybe first we touch on trust and security when we can get into accuracy, which I think is closely related. Yeah. So admittedly, I have a bias here because um, I've also grown up in the security community for the last 30 years with the security being a primary of everything that I think about. So I think one advantage that I may have in that is that I always think about how I use these tool sets from um, a security and privacy point of view. Um, so security one for me, not so not so much of an issue because I'm playing inside of uh, enclosed environment. 
I'm asking in the early stages to go find what it can publicly for me. And I realized um, very early on, like the, the three and 3.5 models um, wouldn't do a web scrape, right? So you have to feed it everything that you want it to analyze. With four, with GPT-4, it'll go do some web scraping for you, you know, do Bing searches and things of that nature fairly easily if you're not very sophisticated in your process yet. But you can get it to go do some web scraping for you. Um, but it's really lazy, right? So <laughs> what GPT, even GPT, GPT-4 being able to do web, web scraping, what it did for me very quickly is, um, you know, I, I had great hopes for now I'm going to be able to go look, um, you know, do a collection and curate at a much faster rate. And it turns out that's not, um, entirely accurate um, because I have what what you will realize very quickly when you start playing with this is that if you say if you leave G, um, GPT-4 on its own to go out and do web scrapes for you then it's um, it's going to be crazy inaccurate if you tell where GPT-4 where you want to do um, those scrapes you can get a little better but one thing it still doesn't do is it's not going to go climb things like document um, ladders for you so if you are, if you want to look at something like um, yesterday, I'm doing an analysis for another company. I want to go look at a white paper for a storage vendor that's out there. Uh, that white paper is 180 some odd pages long, which is not in itself an issue, but it's broken into subsections and those sections are collapsed. What GPT-4 mm -hmm. will not do is go open up each of those sections for you to climb that entire document. So what I find a lot of times, if I want to analyze like 180 pages, man, I do this, you know, we do this because we want to, we get paid to do this and we all smile about doing it, but there are a lot of other people on the other side of the fence that don't want to read 180 pages, you know, to distill that down into what they know. So today I still take a lot of that um, content. I will have to go expand it myself, pull that mm -hmm. in. Now this is going to bleed over into privacy and security, et cetera, as well. But I'm going to go grab that document from that competing website, that 180 pages. I'm going to feed it into GPT, and I'm going to say, "This is what I this is what I want my outcome to be." I'm going to write a TLDR. I want it to be focused on these five personas, et cetera, and distill this into the five key things that I need to communicate if I've only got 30 seconds to speak about this topic, right? So, um, from that respect, it's um, in the early stages. Um, it's it's kind of hard to get yourself in trouble. Um, kind of that your risk factor and your trust factor at the same place. They're both really, really low. Um, and it that will very quickly lead you into an understanding around best practices that you're going to get the best um, input. The things that you want to analyze are going to be things that you as a human will have to interact with and provide context and relevancy to that information. So um, you have to have some level of training yourself on um what you can and can't do as a practitioner, where do you cross the boundaries in security and privacy? You know, um, how far is too far? Um, so um, you will, you as an organization will begin to build your own best practices and your own um, regulations around how you operate artificial intelligence inside your organization. You will, you will draw boundaries as an organization on how you use it. Um, and you as a practitioner will very quickly begin to understand what kind of questions you should and should not ask. And the, the good news for us is that it's not, a, it's not um, at all different than the way that you probably think today, right? You, you know, um, through the SIP framework, et cetera, you know, there are lines that not should, be, uh, should not be crossed. You, you don't ever want to be um, in an espionage ploy. You don't want to be in that kind of movie somewhere. So, you know, it's, it's largely up to yourself today to regulate um, based on your own experience, your own education, the way you operate as a practitioner to, to right. police yourself today and not overstepping those boundaries. That being said, it's really hard to get yourself in trouble. I mean, you, you, uh, today we're, we've all gotten really good at how we run these Boolean string searches when we're out there and finding um, all of this intel that we want. You're really doing this. You're really doing the same things inside AI. You're thinking about it the same way. These are the pieces of information that I want to collect. But now you get to add creativity on top of that collection. It's not just the collection. Now you can move into that creativity part of curation to say, now that you've had all this data collected from these sources that I trust, which touches another topic with the privacy and security and the trust of that, um, I do not blindly accept um, AI to go collect anything for me um, that I haven't um, given it permission to go look for. So when I write my strings, I'm mindful of things like security and compliance, right? I don't wanna go ask something about a, 
um, about Brandon specifically, and I never, God forbid, would want to do something like ask for Brandon's contact information or anything to do with anything that would be personal information for Brandon. So I'm very mindful in the way that I operate that way. Um, you see very right. quickly that it's hard to get yourself in trouble um, because it's it's not um, intelligent. It's only going to, you can only be good at what you tell it to be good at, if that makes sense. And you've got to give it that context of the way I'm most successful today is I give it the data that I have and say, and give it some relevance and context that this is what the data is. This is where it came from. This is why I trust it. Um, and then I can ask my GPT to do things like start to build a trust structure for me based on the way that I've collected and curated and produced this documentation. So do this with AI. This is the biggest favor you can do yourself when you're playing with it is ask it everything that you would ask an expert about AI, just ask AI. Great. That's a great tip. And I think just to go back to something earlier you said, just for anyone that, that missed it, I think it's super important to call out that like your company likely has a policy or is working on a policy. But to your point, James, like even if your company doesn't have a formal AI policy, if you work at a bigger company or, or even a startup that hasn't gotten to it yet, it's likely you know, trust your intuition, right? I think if you follow, for example, Skip's code of ethics when it comes to competitive intelligence, you know, don't impersonate, don't, you know, look for PII, those kinds of things are going to stay true with an AI platform and an AI paradigm. Um, it's just going to be a different medium for that. And so, yeah, don't share customer data into, into, a, into a model is probably a good place to start. And so I think you, if you trust your intuition, you trust the, the kind of guardrails that you've already been using as a competitive intelligence practitioner, I think it's going to serve you well. Uh, to that point, though, I think you make another good point, James, is just, you know, it's, it is hard to get in trouble right now. It is a bit of the wild, wild west. And now is the time to experiment. Of course, don't cross those boundaries, but ask lots of different questions. These tools are changing literally every week. You know, new tools are popping up. New best practices are found. New ways to prompt are being discovered. You know, I remember the, for the first few months after ChatGPT 3 and 3.5 were launched, Reddit was finding all these new ways to jailbreak and ask prompts in creative ways to get through, you know, the, the filters that, you know, OpenAI had created. So this stuff is moving really fast. The best thing you can do is just be a part of it, experiment. Um, and I think you're gonna you're gonna move very far there. When it comes to trust and security, obviously, you know, use your best judgment there. Now, I want to I want to connect to this to accuracy because I think you're touching on this as well. It's obviously related to trust and security, but it's I, I would argue it's an even bigger kind of nut to crack because trust and security there's kind of like there's a line in the sand, you know, there's things that you should and you shouldn't do, but accuracy, I mean, you could prompt an AI tool in all the right ways and it could still give you an inaccurate answer. I mean, everyone, I mean, anyone that's played with a ChatGPT like tool has likely experienced a hallucination. And if you haven't, a hallucination is basically when the AI tool kind of makes something up and it sounds very confident when it answers you. And that's one of the dangers with, with these AI tools. Um, you know, a common example that went viral in the news was it would, uh, when asked for sources, it would completely make up uh, like medical studies that uh, did not exist, but sounded legitimate. And so obviously in a, in a profession like competitive intelligence, competitive enablement, we have to be very mindful of hallucinations. And, you know, just as a, as a call out, you know, you may have seen our blog post on the Clue blog a little while back about, you know, Clue's stance on AI. This accuracy piece we think is incredibly important. And that's why we're not, you know, you know jumping, you know, and, and just providing all the AI tools. I mean, we have a ton of AI features in Clue, but we're very careful with this kind of chat GPT you know, ask question, get answer type interface because of how important accuracy is. And so on that note, I want to kind of share that where I think with these AI tools, if you consider ChatGPT Bard is more the wild, wild west, I think there are a lot of, you know, players in the space, not just Clue, that are taking this more thoughtful approach to think, okay, how do we optimize for the best answer, the highest quality answer and the lowest risk uh, of, of having an inaccurate answer? And so I want to touch on that and... You know, maybe another, maybe I'll, I'll pause there before I jump to the next topic because I think it's super related to third party versus first party uh, uh, insights. And we got a lot of questions around that. Um, but maybe before I do, I'm curious just your thoughts on what I mentioned there, James, around accuracy and if you have any anything you'd add there. Yeah, ac accuracy. That's, uh, um, I depend on myself for the accuracy and validation of the data that I'm going to present to my teams. I never, I never depend on AI. We're in the early stages. Everybody knows that. So in all of these, 
um, talk about the the uh, the clue AI model right now. So when I as a practitioner, when I think about what I need to be able to do, I kind of think about it like this. I have no budget for this year. Right. So I'm not going to get any additional headcount. I'm going to pull this train um, with myself as a single resource, but I still need to keep my performance at the top tier. I need, still, need, still need to be doing all the right things. Battle cards, enablement sessions, you know, my, my newsletter across different personas in the organization, right? So I've taken that on as my charter. So I start looking at, I, I, I feed AI my charter and say, these are the things I need mm -hmm. to accomplish. I'm a single resource to do this. And you had mentioned this earlier, Brandon, um, every single session that I start inside GPT, I start it with, this is who I am. So I say, I am, I am James Raffield. I'm the director of competitive intelligence at X. Um, and this is who I need you to be. So I had joked in our previous AI session that my GPT, I have um, a name for my GPT, right? It's, uh, it's Ben, Adam, and Clara um, from my early days, uh, early days working with, with my, my, uh, my clue um, partners over there. So I say, this uh, is who I am, and this is who I want you to be. And AI would say, you can call me whoever you want to, James, but I'll answer to Clara. So I'd say, okay, Clara, this is what we're going to do today. And it really sets me in a rhythm when I'm, when I'm sitting down and I'm doing this work, the same way when Clara and I are sitting in a room or I'm sitting with Adam somewhere and we're talking through all of these things that we tackle as a, as a CI practitioner, all of the things that we face, all the functions, where do we get our data, like this whole conversation. So I start to have this conversation with my GPT. Um, and I say, I need you to be this for me today. I need you to be my assistant. And these are the five things that we're going to accomplish. Or I need you to be my assistant and we're going to write a document these five ways, right? So, and I and then I tell the assistant what I need from that assistant. So I give very explicit directions on how I need you to help me today, right? So mm -hmm. what I'm looking to do is I'm looking to save time. And this is where I first started. I started with things like, um, I need you to go look at the win loss, uh, win loss analysis or go look at the customer reviews across G2, IDC, Forrester, and, uh, and Gartner, right? So go collect everything you can across Pure Insights, across G2, go get all of that stuff for me um, and come back and then start to do some sort of scrape and collection and try to summarize that, distill that into getting into the strengths and weaknesses, win, win loss, and why they buy and why they don't buy. So... I'm looking at that's those were days of work for me to go collect that. And maybe a source falls off. I've got to go fi find a new source. But I started using AI to help me understand first, I would, you know, feed it and say, go look across these three sites. And then I was like, man, I wonder if it knows more places that I could go look. So I started, do you know more places that I can go look for it? What are some subreddits? What are some backdoor channels that I can go look at forums and those kinds of things? And um, there were times where it was um, very helpful and provide some more insight and give me additional places that I could go look for this data, additional tool sets that I could use. So then clue, you know, in my bottom left-hand corner now, I have my win loss and I, ha I have all of that distilled for me. Um, and I can click on a button and now clue summarizes all of that, you know, why they buy, don't buy likes and dislikes. It's clue today summarizes that for me. So we've seen an evolution of as practitioners, these are the kinds that we were kinds of things that we were thinking about doing, and we can see Clue as a platform now providing that for us. Um, nice. The newsletter, man, that was a newsletter was a couple of days for me um, because I'm trying to, you know, I, my newsletters would have 15 to 20 topics because my competitors were really moving and shaking. They're doing a lot of stuff, and it's changing very quickly. And I couldn't have just five topics. Um, in a monthly newsletter. So I had to move to, you know, 15 to 20 topics across five different personas weekly. Things were just moving that fast. So um, when I went to my manager and said, this is what I'm going to do, it's like, there's no way you can do that. Like it, it takes you a day or two to do the newsletters. Yeah, well, there's this really cool thing in AI that I'm doing now. Now today, um, so I, what I was doing was I was collecting um, all of these insights and across these articles, I would write a TLDR I would write a summary on this is what the article is and what the impact, um, you know, across our go to market, across our revenues, across our partnerships. Um, so I was writing summaries and then I would write a summary on why it matters. Why am I giving this to you? Why do you need to read it? So in the early days, right. I started using AI to help me, you know, condense and consolidate, be more concise with my material, deliver the right message to the right persona. And we see as a platform, Clue has provided this to us now where we're seeing 
summarization of those um, insights that are out there, summar summarization of these articles for our newsletters, you know, thinking about now delivering that same message to multiple personas. So you are thinking these things as a practitioner of what AI and, you know, the things that Clue, as an example, has already done with um, these AI platforms is make us more efficient. We haven't moved into the trust phase yet. Right. But, but you know, we're very good about communicating um, to the community that um, we are not providing things that are based on trust at this point. Right. We this are. Is... Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I, I just wanted to touch on something you said there. I think it's so. This, this getting to that trust level, it touches on something you mentioned like right at the outset there, James, which I think is so important. I want to underscore for everyone, which is you don't outsource the verification of Intel to the model, right? You take full accountability of that verification. And I think that's super critical. And, you know, there was a question we got that just reminded me in the, in the, the bag of questions, um, which was, it was I, I, I'm paraphrasing because I'm going off of memory here, but it was basically like, when do you foresee a competitive intelligence program being fully automated by AI. And, you know, call me a, a call me old fashioned, but I think that the that last layer of trust and verification will always have to be done by a human. Uh, I, I, I'll caveat the always, but, you know, if for those of you that are Clue customers, if you use the Clue platform, you know that the admin is called the curator. And I use that analogy in my head a lot, right? My job as a Clue curator is to curate the intelligence. I am approving what goes into my museum, right? AI might be the Picasso and the Monet and the you know Michelangelo, but I'm curating what's going in there. I have to be responsible for what's going into the museum as the curator. And you know, if if AI gets to that point, which it can do that job better and verify, I think we'll have bigger problems on our hands than uh, competitive right. intelligence. That I think is very close to AGI, artificial general intelligence, because that trust and verification is such a complex challenge. It requires so much business context and you know personal context and understanding that you know would require more than I think a even a. a, a long back and forth in a prompt it requires a ton more context than a single conversation absolutely and and so i want to i want to dovetail this we have a lot of questions around win loss and you know how do you how do we shore up you know it sounds like there were some people that asked questions that have experience using these tools and found similar similarly to you james that there were some incomplete answers because chat gpt a lot of these you know low to no cost tools are really only pulling from what's publicly available i know you know ChatGPT 3, 3.5 was limited to 2021. Then eventually, I think it was ChatGPT 4 unlocked more recent articles, but it still is what's publicly available. It was, uh, there was another great question we got, which is related to this topic I'll just uh, you know recite out, which was, you know, how do you ensure that the AI is providing real answers versus your competitors like marketing spin? Which is a, it's just a real problem, right? Like, cause it, it, what your competitors are putting on their website, if that's, what's going into these AI models, cause it's scraping the web. That's the, the answers that are going to be, bring up. yeah, that is right. That is, and yeah. so I think one of the answers, at least like clue again, I've drank clue Kool-Aid. That's my disclaimer, but we believe that one of those big answers is win loss, right? First party insights directly from buyers, right? Because if your competitor says, yeah, we have these amazing integrations, but you have win loss interviews that says, yeah, we actually used that platform and it wasn't, their integrations weren't what we were sold. It's not what was put on their website. An AI tool that scrapes the web is never going to find that insight out. That is really valuable insight that you have to get directly from a buyer or directly from a customer. And I think that's where the unlock in win loss will be. Um, so maybe I'll stop there. There's a lot of, I think, directions we could go with that, but I'm curious your thoughts, if you agree, disagree. Yeah, man, you're spot it. on. I mean, I think a lot of the tools that have been put out there that help us in our selling journey or or our buying journeys today um, are really about that. One of the things that I, I touched on a little bit ago is really about um, making an emotional connection um, at the right time in that journey, whether it be buying or selling in that. So as a, as a seller, I want the market to buy the software, the SaaS service that I provide. So I'm trying to make, um, I want my messaging um, to be, received at the right time in that journey, right? Buying and selling, accomplishing a task, whatever it is. So I want it to be relevant. It needs to hit the right message at the right time, right? So one of the things that I think AI really helps us do um, in win-loss is as we mature these models to be able to reach out and touch those buyers or prospects, those would-be buyers 
at the at the appropriate time. So there can be a lot of things that we AI is going to help us look at to help us determine, you know, be very deterministic about when the right time is. We'll be able to go look at things like LinkedIn messaging. We we'll able to look at a lot of different sources to determine is this the right time to reach this buyer, and and win loss. One of the top three issues that we've always had first is being able to um, touch that prospect that didn't buy, um, and number two, if you if you do make a connection to that prospect that said no, um, how do we get them to be candid um, and honest with us about why they didn't? Will they really tell us um, everything? Well, we're finding out with the AI tools that I can find a way again, because I'm so mindful of personas, that I can find a way to target that specific individual with the way that I ask those questions to get a real insightful, you know, a, a thoughtful answer rather than just a yes or no, right? I didn't like this or I didn't like that. We're right. We uh, what we're finding is I can use some of these tool sets to make a connection back in at the appropriate time and maybe even parts of other communication um, that I'm doing with that um, with that buyer or that one. That this, did is, buy. Yeah. this is super interesting. And you this is this might sound a little bit off topic, but I promise it's related. You, you just sparked something in my head. It's an analogy that I've been thinking about recently at Clue. So for those that don't know, we have Clue Win Loss, which is a, a product, a platform, but also a service that where we, we employ what we call research directors that go out and interview your buyers. And these are trained research directors that have 20 plus years in market research and have done this in many other roles, maybe at Gartner, Forrester, IDC. And just the reason I bring that up for context, James, what you said there, I, you know, I've thought of this analogy. It's kind of a weird analogy. I don't mean this to be offensive to our research directors because they're amazing, but they're almost like prompt engineers. They are so good at asking the right questions to buyers and customers. Sometimes I'll listen to a win-loss interview because I've, I've conducted a, you know, a few win-loss interviews in my day. And the amount of insight that they can get out of a 30 minute interview, it blows my win-loss interviews out of the water. And, and of course, like I'm, I'm a novice when it comes to prompting our buyers and getting those deep insights. Like, why did you really, you know, leave us or choose the competitor or leave the competitor? And I think that's such a, I, I, I think that was a helpful analogy for me when I was really understanding win-loss, right? Like it's, you, it is effect, essentially prompting. It's, it's understanding and digging to that better answer um, in the same way that you were trying to get a better feature comparison chart out of Chad GPT. Um, yeah. uh, emotionally, yeah. right? Unwavered. So right. In, right. In all of this and everything inside AI and the way that I, as a practitioner, the way that I think about using this is I think about um, my field sellers as an example, um, start at that, that level. My field sellers. Now I have some I have some folks that have been selling for 20, 25 years. I have some folks that have been selling for six months. Right. I don't I do not see that six months as a disadvantage because I know all the fire that that brings and all the passion that that brings. Right. You're not jaded yet. You haven't been burned. Not enough people have told you yes and really meant no. Right. So I am the way that I look at the ways that I'm going to use AI inside the journey, the messaging that I want to create for those field sellers is I want to level the playing field for everybody. I want my people that have been here selling for six months to have access to the same information, the same processes, the same understanding, you know, the, the same ability to make these emotional connections without being emotional, right? That's really what AI is good for in that prompting that you were talking about before. So one side of it is exactly what you described. I will use AI now to make an emotional connection, but ask unemotional questions um, that when a prospect gives me an answer that I don't like, I don't get shut off and not, ex not ask the next question because I don't know what to say or because I got emotional and, and got caught up in it. Like I'm going to eliminate those things with AI and give myself the ability to ask that next question that needed to be asked. What was the next most relevant mm -hmm. thing? So what I like about this is, um, again, this is all human intervention, right? But if we look at the people that are really, really good at this, and I don't mean good just because they always win, but you know, it can be a combination of they have a high percentage rate, but the other person on the other end of the line also felt good about that interaction, right? It, it increased our brand awareness, right? Give us better product awareness. Like I want to look at all of those things and I'm going to look across my best players and you know the best interactions that i've had i'm going to use ai now to go out and constantly monitor my gong calls right and come back and tell me what was successful and what wasn't and now i'm going to use it now to move my material my collateral that i'm producing for my bdrs and my sdrs right so one of the ways that i used this previously was i'm creating now using ai to help me create more content for my 
um, and my clue boards are now filled up and I've got my win loss, why they win. I've got my, you know, objection handling. Like I can now cover everything that I need to cover for my buyers. And now the next thing that I moved into was taking all of this content and collateral that I've created. And at my previous company, we were using um, outreach and, and Kaya. I don't know if you're familiar with those tools, Brandon, yeah, but absolutely. outreach to go record all the cause Kaya is an AI component of that. So I would take this, like why we win, why we lose, or a quick dismiss statement that I had inside my clue boards. And I would go take one of those cards and feed it into Kaya. And Kaya has AI now that is listening to those calls. So inside Kaya, I could say, listen for the person on the other end of the phone. In the early days, I would say, just listen for them to say this competitor. And when they said that competitor name, my card would pop up that came out of clue. And now it pops up and it tells them who that right. competitor is, what they're known for, how we compete. Where where I left that was I figured out very quickly in Kaya that although they told me it was just by keyword, it didn't have to be word. It could actually be phrase or paragraph. So I could say, mm -hmm. if you hear this phrase, now give them a different set of content. If you say this competitor in this product or this competitor in this use case, um, you know, here's a different set of content that's delivered. So the real beauty as practitioners will come into not only when we've gotten better about understanding how we use this at an operational level, right? We don't, we yeah. don't want it to be dependent on it. We want it to go collect facts, but we want to curate to your point. You're always going to have me for context and irrelevancy looking saying, does this apply, um, you know, to the subject that I'm discussing? Can I, can I find a way to weaponize this and make this impactful for my field sellers, for my go-to-market teams? Um, but now the next portion of what I'm looking at is I have all of these tools that I start to lay these foundations with. And now Clue starts to speak to Gong and Outreach and Kaya, not just a, we can pass data over or visualize windows, but now Clue starts to ask questions from Gong. We're, we're hitting this. This is, you know, we're looking at things like a win-loss. Gong, what have you heard of win-loss with this competitor name in here, right? So the possibilities of where we go as compete professionals and what we do with these tool sets I don't, I never look at them as just individual, I, you know, SimRush or any of my um, BI tools or um, any of my um, graphics tools now that I have over here with Dolly and others now trying to help me be more creative in the way that I present these. What I'm doing is creating this community of compete tools um, that now let me move more into, there's an art and science, like you said before, Brandon. So I want to mm -hmm. use what I want to use AI for is I want it to go collect all of this quantitative data and help me use it in a qualitative way. So I can have tremendous insight over there. But one of the things that I want AI to really make strides on over the next year that I think helps us at, as practitioners in this space is that I want to use less words um, in 2024. And I want to be able to take these complex technical um, issues that I have, and those can be I'm producing material, compete material about my products, or if I'm thinking about how do I make this more, um, how do I weaponize this material that I have um, to make a bigger impact on my field sellers and the revenue that they generate. So I don't want to think okay. about just the black and white data, but I want to think about how they use it and how, how can AI help me take very complex subjects and draw pictures that help, um, that make a greater impact um, to my field sellers, to my E's, my SE's, my executives. Like, I feel oh. like the way that I'm looking at this of having to write one document and now branch it to five personas, picture may help us simplify that. So um, that's what I'm, that's what I'm really experimenting with a lot in AI right now is taking complex subjects and distilling those into very simple picture grams. Awesome. I, I know we, uh, we didn't really touch on the future of AI, but if you can believe it, we're already at time. And so uh, just wanted to share, firstly, everyone, thank you so much for joining. It, it, we probably, I think we hit on a lot of the themes out of the questions, but like I said, there were so many good questions in there. Uh, I was chatting with Adam on the side in the, in the green room. I think we'll definitely have to do a mailbag episode at least to go through some of these questions and, and answer more of them. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for, for staying tuned. You know, a ton of you stuck around to the end here. Uh, if you have any questions, if you have any feedback, of course, uh, let us know. We want to make sure that these events are, are valuable for all of you. Uh, but I can share even even having read all these questions and just being at Clue, you know, thinking about AI and CI all the time, chatting with you, James, and going through these. Um, I'm learning a ton, even in this just this past hour. So I uh, really appreciate your time and your expertise, James. Uh, and of course, everyone, everyone here, thank you for your time and attention hey, and uh, taking time out of your Tuesday to to join us. 
uh, and hope to see you at the at the next one. one two, three.